the biggest cover-up of all time is the fact that there is a civilization of people living in the center of Earth, whose civilization's name is known as Agartha. This may be hard for some of you to believe, but some claim to have an absolute knowingness of the truth of this. To begin with the Buddhists, in their theology fervently believe in its existence. They believe it to be a race of supermen and women who occasionally come to the surface to oversee the development of the human race. They also believe that this subterranean world has millions of inhabitants and many cities. And their capital is Shambhala. The master of this world was believed to have given orders to the Dalai Lama of Tibet, who was his terrestrial representative. His messages were being transmitted through certain secret tunnels connecting this inner world with Tibet. The famous Russian channel Nicholas Rurik, who was a channel for the Ascended Master El Moria, claimed that Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, was connected by a tunnel with the inner earth. The entrance of this tunnel was guarded by lamas who were sworn to secrecy. A similar tunnel was believed to connect the secret chambers at the base of the Great Pyramid at Giza and Agartha. The Indian epic, the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita are the two most famous texts of India. The Ramayana tells the story of the great avatar Rama. The Bhagavad Gita tells the story of Krishna. The Ramayana describes Rama as an emissary from Agartha who arrived on in their vehicle. This is quite extraordinary in that both the Buddhist and Hindu religions separately refer to Agartha. The first public scientific evidence occurred in 1947, when Admiral Richard E. Byrd of the United States Navy flew directly to the North Pole. And instead of going over the pole, actually entered the inner earth in his diary with other witnesses he tells of entering the hollow interior of the earth and traveling 1700 miles over mountains lakes rivers green vegetation and animal life he tells of seeing monstrous animals resembling the mammoth of antiquity moving through the underbrush he eventually found cities and a thriving civilization his plane was finally greeted by flying machines, the type he had never seen before. They escorted him to a safe landing place and he was graciously greeted by emissaries from Agartha. After resting, he and his crew were taken to meet the ruler of Agartha. They told him that he had been allowed to enter Agartha because of his high moral and ethical character. They went on to say that ever since the United States had dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they had been very concerned for their own safety and survival. They had decided that it was time to make greater contact with the outside world to make sure we didn't destroy this planet and their civilization with it. They had been allowed in for this express purpose, as a way of making contact with someone they trusted. To make a long story short, Admiral Byrd and his crew, upon their visit, were guided by their hosts in their plane back to the outer world. And their lives were changed forever. In January, 1956, Admiral Byrd led another expedition to the Antarctic. In this expedition he and his crew penetrated for 2,300 miles into the center of Earth again. Admiral Byrd states that the North and South Pole are actually two of many openings to the center of Earth. This sure resembles Jules Verne's famous science fiction book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which many of you may have read or watched the movie. Admiral Byrd also states inner Earth has an inner sun. Admiral Byrd's theory is that the poles of the Earth are convex, rather than concave. Ships and planes can actually fly or drive right in. The American press announced Admiral Byrd's discovery. However, it was immediately suppressed by our good friends, the secret government.
Ray Palmer, the editor of Flying Saucer magazine did a detailed story on Admiral Byrd's discoveries. The United States government either bought, stole or destroyed almost every copy, and then destroyed the plates of the printing press. According to rumors, the exact same thing happened in respect to an article done on Admiral Byrd's discovery by the National Geographic. The magazine was released and the US government gobbled up almost every issue. If the story wasn't true, how come the government was so uptight? Another interesting fact is that the United States government does not let planes fly over the poles. All flights are directed to go around the poles, and any airline pilot flying in these areas will tell you this. Another interesting phenomena is the fact that the icebergs are composed of fresh water and not salt water that drift from the poles. Another interesting question is why it is warmer nearer the poles than it is 600 to 1000 miles away from it. One of the early writers to present the theory of the Earth being hollow with openings at its poles was an American thinker. William Reed, author of the book, Phantom of the Poles published in 1906. This book provides an early compilation of scientific evidence, based on the reports of Arctic explorers, in support of the theory that the Earth is hollow with openings at its poles. Reed estimates that the crust of the Earth has a thickness of 800 miles, while its hollow interior has a diameter of 6,400 miles. Reed summarizes his revolutionary theory as follows. The Earth is hollow. The poles, so long sought, are phantoms. There are openings at the northern and southern extremities. In the interior are vast continents, oceans, mountains and rivers. Vegetable and animal life are evident in this new world. And it is probably peopled by races unknown to dwellers on the Earth's surface. Reed pointed out that the Earth is not a true sphere, but is flattened at the poles, or rather it begins to flatten out as one approaches the hypothetical North and South Pole, which really do not exist because the openings to its hollow interior occur there. Hence the poles are really in mid-air in the center of the polar openings, and are not on its surface as some discoverers of the poles suppose. Reed claims that the poles cannot be discovered because the Earth is hollow at its pole points, which exist in mid-air. Due to the existence there of polar openings leading to its interior, when explorers thought they reached the pole, they were misled by the eccentric behavior of the compass in high latitudes, north and south. Reed claims that this happened in the case of Peary and Cook, neither of whom really reached the North Pole, as we shall later see. Starting at 70 to 75 degrees north and south latitude the Earth starts to curve inwards. The pole is simply the outer rim of a magnetic circle around the polar opening. The North Magnetic Pole, once thought to be a point in the Arctic archipelago, has been lately shown by Soviet Arctic explorers to be a line approximately 1,000 miles long. However, as we stated above, instead of being a straight line, it is really a circular line constituting the rim of the polar opening. When an explorer reaches this rim, he has reached the North Magnetic Pole. And though the compass will always point to it after one passes it, it is really not the North Pole. Even if one is deluded into thinking it is, or that he discovered the pole due to having been misled by his compass. When one reaches this magnetic circle, meaning the rim of the polar opening, the magnetic needle of the compass points straight down. This has been observed by many Arctic explorers who, after reaching high latitudes, near to 90 degrees, were dumbfounded by the inexplicable action of the compass and its tendency to point vertically upward. 
They were then inside the polar opening and the compass pointed to the Earth's north magnetic pole which was along the rim of this opening. As the Earth turns on its axis, the motion is gyroscopic, like the spinning of a top. The outer gyroscopic pole is the magnetic circle of the rim of the polar opening. Beyond the rim the Earth flattens and slopes gradually toward its hollow interior. The true pole is the exact center of the opening at the poles, which consequently, do not really exist. And those who claim to have discovered them did not tell the truth, even if they thought they did. Having been misled by the irregular action of the compass at high latitudes. For this reason, neither Cook nor Peary nor any other explorer ever reached the North or South Poles. And never will.
This is the Music Memory Lane, and welcome to Chapter 3 of my Hollow Earth series. Well, I thought a lot about how to present my third Hollow Earth video, and I figured the robot voice needed a break. So in this video, I do all the talking. Well, in part 2, I told you about an alleged UFO crash in Freiburg, Germany. Although there is almost no evidence to back this up, I strongly believe something or someone was helping the Germans to become the most advanced nation on this planet during the Second World War. You have to realize that Hitler's inner circle was teeming with individuals that were obsessed with the occult and the paranormal. People like Rudolf Hess and Hitler himself were convinced that a race of superhumans escaped the surface of our planet during a cataclysmic event. Perhaps an event that resembled the biblical giant flood. Secret societies like the Thule and Frill Society were absolutely obsessed in obtaining occult artifacts like the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant and the Spear of Destiny. The Spear of Destiny was one of those artifacts they did manage to obtain. It has been said that those who own the Spear of Destiny will become undefeatable. So it's not hard to understand why the Germans were so desperate to find these items. We have to ask ourselves some critical questions. How was Germany able to overcome the hardship of the Versailles Treaty? The inflation, the millions of Reichsmarks they had to pay to France and England after losing the First World War. A nation in complete rubble. And in a matter of years, Germany had become one of the most leading nations in the world. How was that possible? And whatever answer you can come up with, doesn't make sense until you realize that Nazi Germany must have been held by forces unknown. There's no way Germany could have done this all by itself, especially when you look at the financial side of the story. Who do you think loaned Hitler all that money? Do your own research and find out. The superior advanced Germany technology still puzzles me and many others to this day. Some claim they were 50 years ahead, perhaps even more. And it's all contributed to Germany's willingness to use the latest technology to their advantage. While all the other nations have failed to recognize the possibilities. Well, I have a hard time believing this. While Hitler was searching for occult artifacts all over the world, the most sacred of all crashed into the forest of Freiburg in 1936, almost on top of their heads. Opportunity came knocking, that's for sure. Now, let me take you back to Maria Ostrick and the Frail Society. Maria Ostrick was known to channel messages and acted as a medium on several occasions. She was a regular guest at Heinrich Himmler's castle, and she took part in many channel sessions. She could even summon the spirits of deceased Nazi party members. They still advised their comrades from within their graves. Go figure. Maria Ostrich played an essential role in these sessions, and she was destined to become one of the first to ever contact an extraterrestrial present in modern times. Now, Maria was sent for after the craft and its occupants were transported to Himmler's castle. She would have examined the diseased or even living pilots of the craft herself, perhaps laying her hands on their bodies. Or did she make contact by telepathy? Is it a coincidence that alien abductees often describe this form of communication as being the most common? It isn't hard to imagine that contact was made with the planet where these entities originated from. 
whether by physical contact or by channel sessions only. But one thing is for sure, Maria Ostrich received a lot of essential information during her channel sessions. Blueprints of exotic forms of technology were drawn on paper by Maria herself. The blueprints contain detailed information on how to create an anti-gravity engine. This allowed the Germans to create the most advanced flying crafts, such as the Haunabu and Frill crafts. They were in fact the first u boat built by humans, and possibly the source of the full fighter legend. Allied bombers who were heading towards Germany were often accompanied by small orbs or strange lights. Small craft that were behaving like no other plane like they had ever witnessed. The Foo Fighters caused a huge amount of fear and confusion amongst Allied bomber personnel. Could these alleged Foo Fighters be in fact experimental German flying saucers? You know, sometimes I wonder the Germans were the first to sign the treaty with the Somalian race. We can only assume that we know what they had to offer, but what did Germany offer them in return? It is claimed that the Nazis were setting up a secret base for advanced weapon and flight experiments, as well as a place to escape should the war not go to plan. This was also detailed in newspapers of the time. In the Vierjahresplan, the four-year plan, promoting the Third Reich's plan to colonize the Neuschwabenland. And their plans also involved a person that would become synonymous for the Hollow Earth theory. In late 1938, Admiral Byrd visited Hamburg and was invited to participate in the 1938-1939 German Neuschwabenland. Antarctic expedition by the Nazis. Byrd had a great knowledge of the Antarctic area. He had already been on several expeditions there previously. However, Byrd declined. The Nazi expedition discovered several ice-free regions with lakes and small signs of vegetation. The expedition geologists said this phenomenon was due to hot springs. This discovery led to Heinrich Himmler to hatch a bold plan to build a permanent base in Antarctica. That base was codenamed Station 211. Admiral Kardernitz announced its completion in 1943 by saying, The German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Führer in another part of the world a Shangri-La on land, an impregnable fortress. There are many stories around Station 211, one of which details a supposed treasure room which held the Holy Lands or the Holy Spear that pierced the side of Jesus Christ on the cross, as I mentioned earlier. Why Antarctica? During the Nazi expeditions to Tibet, they were given access to secret cave systems of the Tibetan monks that had not been seen for centuries. The Tibetans believed the arrival of the Nazis fulfilled their own prophecies that would usher in a new age of enlightenment. During the exploration of the caves by the Nazis, it is claimed that a secret volume of ancient texts from pre-flood times or even from Atlantis were found. These texts are supposed to have detailed where the opening to the hollow earth could be found and Hitler believed that an Aryan race dwelling there would help them win the war. It is claimed that after World War II, Adolf Hitler did not commit suicide in 1945, but fled to Argentina, then on to Station 211 in Antarctica. Numerous Nazi submarines went missing after World War II, and it's supposed that these were used to transport Hitler and others. Two submarines surfaced in Argentina, three months after the war. They were captured by the Allies and interrogated by the Secret Service. It is believed that these U-boats were the ones who transported Hitler and Eva Braun to Station 211. 
any possible evidence on both U-boats were missing. No name tags, no coordinates, no maps, nothing. But the Southern American Assembly of an Antarctic Research Expedition suggests that one of the crew members had failed to shut his mouth. Now, Admiral Byrd was sent to Antarctica. Publicly, it was just a research expedition. However, the amount of manpower sent was huge compared to the former Nazi Antarctic expedition. The massive Antarctic task force included 4,700 men, 13 ships and multiple aircraft. Just to give you an impression of the scale of this operation. Admiral Byrd comments in his press release of November 12, 1946, stated that the purposes of the operation are primarily of a military nature. That is to train naval personnel and to test ships, planes and equipment under frigid zone conditions. A major purpose of the expedition is to learn how the Navy's standard everyday equipment will perform under everyday conditions. Operation High Jump was designed to last eight months. However, they returned after two weeks, losing many heavy equipment and planes. And now we have to wonder, was Operation High Jump a cover to finish off Hitler? With the amount of manpower sand, it could be the case. But did they succeed to destroy the last Nazi stronghold? Judging by their early departure, I have a feeling they failed to wipe out the remaining Germans. On the way back from his disastrous mission, Bird gave an interview to a prestigious newspaper in Chile on March 5, 1947. The article states, Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate defense measures against the possible invasion of the country by hostile aircraft operating from the polar regions. As regards the recently terminated expedition, Byrd said that the most important result of the observations and discoveries made is the current potential effect which they will have on the security of the United States. Well, this of course is the censored version. Others claim Byrd had actually warned the United States government for an enemy that was able to fly from pole to pole in several minutes. And the most bizarre rumor I ever heard is when Admiral Byrd returned home, he was invited by the president himself. The president wanted to hear what happened to Byrd and his Navy fleet. Well, Admiral Byrd allegedly begged and pleaded the president to nuke the hell out of the polar region. He urged the president to drop several nuclear bombs on the alleged Nazi fortress. According to many deathbed confessions by expedition members, the fleet was approaching the entrance of base 211. All of a sudden, a fleet of u type crafts emerged from the icy waters and attacked the fleet with fierce aggression. Several ships were sunk in minutes. Many sailors lost their life that day. Witnesses also stated that German ground troops were defending the entrance of the base with strange weapons that fired sonic waves. The whole experience must have been terrifying to Byrd and his men. Finally, Byrd gave the order to retreat. He knew that if he would stay there any longer, his entire fleet would be destroyed. Well, now I will conclude this video with the most shocking rumor. At least the most shocking rumor I ever heard. You know, scientists always talk about how thin the ozone layer is at the North Pole, right? By measuring the thickness of the ozone layer at the poles, they can tell us in which condition the ozone layer is. Our polluting waves are the main reason for the thin ozone layer, according to scientists. But what if the ozone layer was already damaged? What if the Allies listened to Admiral Byrd's advice and decided to drop multiple atom bombs on the alleged base? Base 211. Imagine how long it would take for the ozone layer to recover. But hey, it's all rumors.